You stand before the gates of another video in Noodle's complete Path of Exile lore series. This video is part two on Azaro's Lord's Labyrinth. Let's begin. As we touched on in part one, Chittis Parandis and his uncle Kadiro found the creation of the Labyrinth madness and an insult to the contributions of the Parandis family to the Eternal Empire. The Parandis family had been around since the founding of the Empire and the city of Sarn. The marketplace we explore in Act 3 is informally referred to as the Parandis Markets. Kadiro wrote, that the same day Veruso planted his banner in the soil of Sarn, the Parandis family built the first market stall. That one stall spawned so many others that the people came to call our venture the Parandis Markets. We were never vain enough to make the name official. Until Chittis took the throne, we were a most unassuming consortium. By the time Azaro created his lab, the Parandis were well established and incredibly wealthy. So Chittis and Kadiro began scheming to rig the lab run for Chittis to win the first Lord's Labyrinth in over 1,200 years. Chittis wrote multiple letters to his uncle Kadiro regarding Izaro, his lab, and these schemes to ensure Chittis won the title of Emperor. Chittis' own father was not interested in helping Chittis cheat. Chittis wrote to Kadiro, while my father remains determined to play the role of Azaro's lapdog, I trust that you and I are of like mind regarding our glorious emperor's ridiculous labyrinth. He would have us entrust our imperial leadership to the primitive diversions of some cave-dwelling ancestors. It is beyond reasoning. In fact, it can only be surmised that Azaro himself is also beyond reasoning. Chittis and Kadiro paid people constructing the labyrinth to give them information about the mechanisms being created. According to Chittis, I have purchased several of Azaro's overseers and they keep me informed. And Kadiro purchased architectural plans of the labyrinth for Chittis, who replied, I have familiarized myself with the architectural plans you have so kindly obtained for me and I have paid certain overseers handsomely regarding Azaro's various hazards and living horrors. Chittis also had those overseers under his payroll place caches of supplies for his eventual run through the labyrinth. Chittis even paid for hits on Azaro, all of which failed. Chittis entrusted his own cousin, Elano, who was not a Parandus by name, to organize Azaro's death and by doing so, the cousin could earn the Parandus title. Chittis was frustrated by these failures. Our eternal emperor, Izaro, might be insane, but he's clearly not stupid. Or at the very least, he has had the presence of mind to surround himself with clever people. Three meticulously planned attempts on Izaro's life. Three astutely thwarted failures. Of course, none of them can be traced back to us, as for Cousin Ilano, he will be dead by sunrise. We need not fear any inconvenient disclosure on his part, and he is not a Parandus by name. His familial connection is known only to us. Legitimacy is a useful carrot to dangle. Since the assassination attempts failed, Chittis and Kadiro had to simply prepare for the labyrinth run by Chittis. Through their communications with Izaro's architects, Chittis and Kadiro were able to learn about many of Azaro's planned traps and trials, which we see ourselves in the lab. Azaro, since he could not find exact descriptions of the lab runs Veruso and Caspiro had to complete, took the information about other ancient Asmiri trials and altered them through his own imagination. Chittis muses, the man, Azaro, is obsessed with spikes. They pop out of the floor, spin on treacherously shifting wheels, and even roam about like predators in search of prey. Izaro's mechanisms are truly of the most devious design. And the creatures, if it bites, claws, or stings, it now lives in that labyrinth. Izaro began creating his lab in 1316. It seems the lab's construction was completed in 1318, and in 1319, Chittis Parandus was crowned as emperor. Fun fact, one of the lab trials, the High Gardens, outside of the Scepter of God and near the Sarn Library, was a test run of Izaro's labyrinth before the official Lord's Labyrinth was opened. Izaro was very attentive to perfecting his trials and labyrinth. 
One interesting aspect of the Lord's Labyrinth that isn't expanded upon is Izaro's dog, Argus. Reddit user, and I apologize for pronunciation, Uizui, suggested that Argus was a sort of first draft for the Minotaur Shaper Guardian. Apparently, the Minotaur fight was supposed to include arc traps, which we see in the current Minotaur as the electric fences, but arc traps was not released in time for ascendancy, so they believe Argus was a first draft Minotaur. Thus, Argus was put into the lab without any real lore or explanation. I personally think that Argus is inspired from the dog Argos, Odysseus's dog in the Odyssey. TLDR of Argos's role in the Odyssey, Odysseus disappears for 12 years, suitors take over his home trying to woo his wife Penelope, the dog Argos is severely neglected in those 12 years. Odysseus comes back to the house dressed as a beggar to avoid recognition, Argos recognizes him through his disguise but cannot move to his horrible condition from being neglected. Odysseus cannot acknowledge the dog without giving himself away, so he passes by, and Argos dies, a very neglected, but very good boy. We have no idea how or why Argus is in the labyrinth, but Azaro does refer to him much like a dog, saying he enjoys new playthings, and you killed my poor little Argus when you defeat him. Izaro is never mentioned to have a dog in the lore, but the similarity of the name Argos and Argus led me to this theory. Regardless of Argus's origins, Izaro's purpose was clear, to create a labyrinth full of the most arduous trials to test the strength and intelligence of those who attempted it. Izaro greatly expanded on the ancient rough-hewn maze festooned with wild animals and brutal traps, and believed that in conquering the adversities of the maze, a champion proved they were capable of bearing the crushing burden of chieftainship. Izara was fond of musing about the attributes of a good leader, and how the Asmerian trials would prove true worth in the next leader, rather than Izara selecting a new emperor himself. Who then to choose as my successor, with the candidates on hand either mediocre at best, or maniacal at worst, I found myself in quite the quandary. It makes one wonder where Izara would have placed Chittis Parandus on that spectrum, as we can assume Chittis had made his desire for the title of Emperor clear before being forced to enter the labyrinth, even though the lab was now rigged in his favor. Izaro had a truly prophetic musing about the next Emperor. Strong leadership is able to bridge the chasm between existence and extinction. Poor leadership might see an entire tribe vanish into that same chasm. Chittis Parandus was the main benefactor of Malachi, who caused the cataclysm in 1336 IC, just two years after Chittis' reign ended. While the cataclysm happened under the rule of High Templar Vol, it was absolutely Chittis' empowering of Malachi that gave Malachi the tools and power to manipulate Vol and cause the cataclysm. For more info on Chittis' reign and the Cataclysm, watch the videos about Act 3 and Act 4. Thank you so much for watching, it's your boy Noodle. Conquerors of Atlas is coming out soon, and I will have videos on Xana, Shaper, and Elder coming out shortly after the new expansion and League, so look out for those. Thanks as always to my patrons. If you want to see videos early, vote on upcoming videos, or see more pictures of my cat Sunday, consider joining my Patreon, link below. If you have questions, feel free to ask here, or on my Twitch stream at twitch.tv kittencatnoodle. And as always, stay sane, exile.